Alexis Nicole Nelson is a forager who has fostered a huge following by sharing her hilarious and educational content, helping her followers learn how to identify and prepare edible plants she finds growing around her neighborhood in Columbus, Ohio. Welcome, Alexis. Hello, everybody. Oh my gosh, everyone is from all over the place. I, I'm seeing a lot of Ohio representation. Love to see it. Um, but oh my gosh, I think I saw some folks say they were uh, they were coming in from Thailand and from Paris. So that's all oh, very cool, gently overwhelming. Very excited to be here, everybody. Um, as Grace so wonderfully introduced me, my name is Alexis Nicole Nelson, for anybody who does not know. And for anyone who does not know what my thing is, I eat plants that don't belong to me and teach you to do the same. So today's lecture is all about fun fall foraging. Now, because this is programming for the U.S. Botanic Garden, I did like pretty heavily lean on East Coasty plants, but a lot of these have West Coast and global counterparts, and we will cover those when we get to them. So welcome to Fun Fall Foraging. About me, my intro about myself is not going to be as great as Grace's. I educate people about wild food. I do not have an inside voice, much to my parents' chagrin. And I was partially raised by social media like everyone else between the ages of 30 and 20. <laughs> Uh, because of that, the way that I have chosen to express myself and show all of the wild and occasionally weird food that I make is using my TikTok and my Instagram and my Twitter. Uh, it used to be my Tumblr. Don't go looking for it. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> Who's on Tumblr anymore? No offense to people who are. Uh, but let's jump right into it. I know, RIP Tumblr. Those were some of the best days. Uh, of my social media life. I miss it. I miss it. The aesthetics. What a nice time to be a teenager or 20 something. <laughs> now let's meet some plants. Jumping right on in. I was very excited. I rigged this one with animations, um, which I don't believe I did for the last one. So first, we are going to talk about burdock. Now, for those of you who were with us for the spring programming, I believe Burdock got a shout out there too, but I was talking about the spring veggie that is easier to harvest from Burdock, and that is the pre-flower Burdock stalk. And if you are asking yourself, Alexis, now what in the heck is a Burdock? Well, if you don't recognize it uh, from these giant kind of frilly leafies and these beautiful, but also very pokey burrs, uh, it is that plant that probably gets stuck in your dog's fur a lot during the late summer through the mid fall. If you have a dog like me, Colonel Mustard brings in at least one from our backyard every single time he comes back in the house. And those are not the part that you are going to eat. What you want to be eating in the fall and through the winter, if you are lucky enough to not have your ground freeze solid like ours does, are the roots. Now, burdock roots are known as gobo in uh, Japanese cooking, and it's very wild to me whenever a plant looms large in one country's culinary history and doesn't in another, despite the fact that we have a ton of that plant too. And this is one of them. So this is the time for you to be scoping out those first year burdock plants, the ones who were those tiny little burrs last year germinated during the year this year. And right now, they're not gonna be big. It's just going to be a miniature version of one of those big, gently fluffy leaves, maybe two, maybe three, all coming out of a central point in the ground. It's much easier to spot the second year plants, but alas, they have a two year lifespan. You will not want the roots of the second year plants. They are essentially wood, uh, don't eat them. You will be sad. Your stomach will be sad. I will be sad. 
But the great thing about seeking out the rapidly dying second year plants is it will give you a very good hint as to where to look for first year ones because they don't travel an insane distance from their parents. So right now I have two second year plants in my backyard that flowered this year. And sure enough, just as the temperatures have started dropping in the last two weeks, a bunch of little babies have started popping up within about a 30 foot radius of both plants. Perfect for me. I'm going at some of them with my soil knife later this evening uh, because they are also next door neighbors in my lawn with dandelions. Dandelions also have a bit of a renaissance of renaissance when the weather starts getting chilly again. Ah, oh, there we go. Yes. The humble dandelion, by this time, I think this is a lot of people's entry into foraging, especially urban foraging. If you can find a place that you know is free of spraying and free of, you know, animals doing their business, because I know that that uh, disenfranchises a lot of people when it comes to foraging, Find those dandelions. Those are the dandelions you want to go for. Um, I am lucky enough that my lawn is about 30% dandelion at any given time. And while earlier in the spring, I was telling people, go for those fresh greens while they're still young and tender. Go for those first flowers. Batter them up. Have yourself a healthy little snack. You can do those things in the fall as well. A caveat, the greens are going to be more bitter than they were in the spring. That's fine. They're still edible. I still think they're delicious. They just may not be everyone's uh, cup of tea. Flowers typically start coming back up again when the temperature decides to grace us with being below 80 degrees for an extended period of time. So if you're into harvesting the flowers, that's, you know, you can get a second chance to do that this time of year, too. I am seeing some friends in the chat mentioning bees. So I will say as we're getting towards the end of the season, maybe leave a couple for the bees. They're very rapidly, you know, running out of things that they can be harvesting nectar from. So it's, it doesn't hurt to keep them in mind. But the thing that I love harvesting from dandelions as the weather is getting colder, they are going to start deprioritizing what is above the ground and they are going to start prioritizing what is beneath the ground, and that is those roots. Now, the roots can be prepared in a myriad of different ways. We love an SAT word, myriad, uh, for any of my fans, any fans of the movie Heathers, that word looms large in it. And you can eat it either as a veggie, like you would with, say, burdock root. With gobo, you can, you know, slice them up real nice, peel off that tougher outer layer if you find particularly large roots, saute them with an oil of your choice, some salt, some pep, some garlic, have yourself a nice little root feast. Or my personal favorite thing to do with dandelion roots, and I made a video about it earlier this year, probably gonna do some more about it uh, in the next week or so, is making dandelion root coffee, which is when you are going to clean those roots, Give them a nice chomperoonie into some smaller pieces, and you are going to roast them in your oven, I, like I'd say like a comfy 400 degrees for about 20 minutes, until your entire kitchen smells like baked goods and coffee, which, let me tell you, if you want to make a person you live with very disappointed, do that, have them come down the stairs expecting tasty treats, and then tell them it's dandelion roots. Bada bing, bada boom. Uh, that being said, the coffee that they make once you add hot water to those roasted root pieces is mwah, chef's kiss. If you're a person who, for whatever reason, is kicking caffeine or wants, you know, the taste and the warmth and the ritual of coffee, say, you know, at 2.01 p.m. instead of 1.59 p.m., knowing full well that once you cross that threshold, it means that you will be awake for the rest of the night. It might just be me. That might just be me. This is an excellent alternative. Um, for anyone uh, keeping an eye on my TikTok or my Instagram, I am going to be testing using powdered roasted dandelion roots in my homemade Nutella. If you never see a video about it, it's because it was bad. So shh, 
That's a, that's a secret that we will keep if a week goes by and you don't see a video about dandelion root and wild hazelnut Nutella. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yes. Not me forgetting how many blurbs of words I put on my own slides. <laughs> Yes, I would recommend going for the roots this time of year. Uh, that being said, still a good time to try the greens and the flowers if you didn't get the opportunity to do so in the spring. They're really just all purpose. What can't they do? Um, if you're lucky enough to have a ton of flowers, dandelion flower wine, also absolutely delightful. But we can talk about that more in the spring. Mm-hmm. Hey, Alexis, can I ask you a couple questions from our questions? Tab? Oh, you absolutely can. Awesome. So we've got somebody asking what burdock root tastes like. Oh, oh my gosh. So I would say kind of like a, like a starchy version of, say, like an artichoke heart. Like if an artichoke heart and a potato had a baby, I think that is what I would most liken gobo too which makes sense artichokes are also in that like thistle family along with the burdocks i think the artichoke flavor comes through much more strongly in the stalks that you gather in the spring but there's definitely still a hint of it there um but they are nice and starchy i feel like you could make a mash with them like you would with a potato you might want to add a little bit of like a, a, a cream or a milk or a not milk of your choice, whatever you have in your kitchen at this uh, present time. And I think it would make a pretty nice mash. Yeah. Thanks, Alexis. Oh, I see Jennifer in the chat saying she pickles burdock roots. Pickled burdock root slaps. I did a soy pickle with them for the first time in early spring this year. And who was going to tell me that they're delicious? <laughs> Yay. Okay. That was a great question. Oh my gosh. And the next plant that we are moving on to, some of you may recognize it already. Anyone in the chat uh, want to wanna go ahead and shout it out if they know who this is? Oh, yep. There it is, Haley. Thank you. Thank you. This is indeed the autumn olive oh rachel's in the chat hello friend how dare people i know and love be here you sweet beans <laughs> this is the autumn olive it is elegonus umbellata which come on there it is cool beans it is an invasive here in north america so i will say that this is one that you should have no qualms about harvesting all that you want, because if you don't, the birds will. Uh, but when the birds poop out the seeds, it's not into a toilet, it's into someone else's yard, uh, which means there will just be more autumn olives, which in like a short term, kind of I like eating wild things standpoint seems really great, but unfortunately, it is so good at its job, which is growing and procreating, that it has a tendency to choke out some of our other native species. Now, this is one of my favorite ones to teach people to recognize from a distance. Uh, sometimes when I'm in the car with my friends and we're like speeding down the highway and I'm just like, oh, look, an autumn olive, as we're like doing a gentle 71 on the Ohio highways. And my friends will be like, stop. Why do you know that? Um, and it is because these guys have a very silvery appearance uh, compared to the rest of the greenery around them, especially right now, just before the leaves start turning. Do you guys see in this like bottom photo right here how the autumn olive has a lighter, almost blue and white tinged green to it compared to all of this very vibrant yellow green around? Yes, and I'm seeing some folks in the chat uh, giving my second favorite ID with the berries and the best way to tell that it is autumn olive and not honeysuckle. And that is that the berries have built in sparkles, y'all. Built in sparkles. The leaves do too. Uh, so we can also give it up for the leaves. The leaves are metallic and silvery on the underside, which is what gives them that light gray green appearance from a distance. 
but those sparkles carry on to the berries. I am a very, anyone who knows me knows this. I like very loud clothing, makeup, etc. You name it. So I just feel like the autumn olive and I understand each other. I love the sparkles. Another really fun thing that happens is if you are, say, harvesting some twigs to dry, put into a bouquet, if you will, when the leaves die and turn brown, that silvery underside becomes like a bronze underside. Uh, I don't know. I have a lot of mixed feelings about invasives, but I think I might want some autumn olive twigs in my wedding bouquet when that day comes. Now, when it comes to flavor, Right now, we are sitting at what I like to call like the pomegranate seed stage, both in that they have the little edible seed on the inside. Some people like spitting them out. Do not spit them out onto a place where they can grow. <laughs> I had to tell my mom that this past, uh, this past summer, as we were snacking on a few near her house in Massachusetts, I was like, you dare, don't do it. Our, our, our sweet beach plums can't take it. They cannot compete. So before first frost, I say that they're very bright, very tart. They have a wee bit of uh, tannicness to them. If you find them too early, they will dry out your mouth in a similar way to an unripe persimmon. Um, but once they get hit with that frost, they sweeten a bunch. Or if you just wait long enough. Last year, we had our first frost really late. Um, that being said, the autumn olives definitely still had the time to develop more of those sugars inside of the fruits, and they were delicious, even though I didn't have to cry about the passing of summer first. <laughs> so that is the autumn olive. Please eat all of them. I'm not kidding. <laughs> It's one of the ones that, like, I know park rangers who are like, hmm, normally I would say don't forage in my park, but please eat all of the autumn olives. <laughs> hey, Alexis, we've got a couple questions about this plant. Oh, absolutely. Here, let me see if I can go back. There we go. So we've got someone saying they've heard them called Russian olive and sweet olive. Are yeah. they the same thing or different? They are the same thing. It has a lot of names. A lot of them are olive adjacent, which I find confusing. <laughs> that is confusing. And we've got someone else saying, how are the berries sparkly? So that's actually a really, that's actually a really good question. Uh, the entire plant just has a very fine metallic sparkle and sheen to them. And when the berries are still very small and brown, having been like, you know, freshly pollinated in the spring. Um, they look much more like the undersides of the leaves in that they are one cohesive, like matte bronze all the way around. And those sparkles, as the berry expands, also expand and have a bit more space in between them. So instead of looking metallic, they just look like a, a sweet child came and sprinkled sparkles across all of them. But... I am not a botanist, and now I want to know the answer to why it is maybe that we suppose evolutionarily that the autumn olive felt like it needed to be this showy. Thanks, Alexis. <laughs> no, thank you guys for the excellent questions. And I was just mentioning the persimmon, and I did it on purpose. It's almost like I practiced or something. Next up, we have... Diospiros virginiana, one of my personal favorites that literally, as you can see, I am just barely in the range for, and that is the American persimmon. I obsessed is a bit of an understatement. Uh, I don't tag a ton of things on my Google Maps here in Columbus, just because I really like happening upon things and I'm typically like very good at remembering where everything is. But one of the things, one of the plants that I always put a pin in for are American persimmon trees, mostly just so I can calculate how much time it's going to take for me to travel between all of them once fruit starts falling, which if you are in Southeastern Ohio, Persimmons are already falling and nothing about this year makes any sense. I ate two perfectly ripe persimmons at the Pawpaw Festival last week and they were delicious. 
Um, so a few things about the American persimmon. I know a lot of folks who are joining us from the West Coast, a lot of folks who are joining us from uh, Eastern Asia will be familiar with some of the other Diospiros genus members like Diospiros kaki, um, more familiar with the Fuyu persimmons and the Hachia persimmons, which are a lot heftier than the American persimmon. A lot of times when I give someone one of these for the first time, uh, they are a little bit disappointed because if you are lucky, they will be like a third of the size of a regular um, Fuyu persimmon that you would pick up in say a grocery store. That being said, when I tell you that it makes up for its lack of stature and how delicious it is, you have to believe me. I call them tree marmalade um, because they get like soft and gooey and spreadable. And the way that the sugars develop in them, they, they have like very caramely notes without being cooked at all. Uh, just eaten fresh off of the ground, off of the ground. Do not pick firm persimmons. I'm leaning into my microphone for emphasis. Do not pick up firm persimmons from the tree. Your mouth will be so sad. Uh, persimmons are excellent at protecting themselves to make sure that their fruits get to reach their full potential by being just tannic as all get out until their fruit are ripe. And an excellent indicator that a fruit is ripe enough to eat is that the fruit will fall from the tree. That being said, every once in a while, you will still get faked out by one that has fallen. Sometimes when I'm feeling a bit eager beaver and I shake the tree and one falls, uh, one will fall maybe a day or two before it necessarily wanted to. Last year, I had one that was perfectly soft, put it right into my mouth, and then uh, my mouth was the Sahara Desert for about 10 minutes afterwards. That being said, they are delicious enough that they are worth the risk. Just wait for them to fall. Patience is a hard game for all of us, especially when you're so excited about finding a tree and you don't necessarily know uh, when you're going to be able to visit it again. But when I tell you that is the patience is the name of the game when it comes to the American persimmon and you will be rewarded if you wait. I'm also glad to see that some people are reporting that persimmons are already falling in their neck of the woods because that makes me feel significantly less crazy. Thank you. Last week, I was just like, I don't know how or why this is happening, uh, but I'm glad that it is happening in other places. The persimmons here in Columbus, for anyone who's here in Columbus with me, there is a large one near Ohio State's campus that typically starts dropping this time of year, but the fruits are really tiny. Uh, there are a couple others spread out across the city, and I would say they will start dropping in mm, like two weeks. That's how it's that's how it's been the last three years. Yay. Um, if you go and collect them at night, be prepared to make friends with some possums. <laughs> Okay, now we are going uh, back to another set of non-natives and occasional invasives. And that is going to be our crab apples and our ornamental pears, both of which are typically planted in cityscapes, along roads, um, maybe at the edges of parks. And the one that I want to call out in particular, if you are in a city, where they were not super careful about which Bradford slash calorie pears were chosen, I'm going to tell you to eat the calorie pears slash Bradford pears. I hear the two names interchangeably and equally because that is another fruit that you do not want the birds to be spreading uh, because they are an even worse invasive than the autumn olive, in my opinion, mostly because they smell awful in the springtime. Uh, and they also choke out our native trees. So this is, I believe it is Paris Caloriana. I don't know why I did not add the binomial nomenclature for this one, probably because it is also covering our crab apples. Um, we're in the thick of crab apple season right now. In fact, if you are further south than me, 
It might even uh, be coming to a close or be closed already. I still have a tree full of crab apples out in my front yard that I really need to get around to harvesting soon. One of my favorite things about crab apples and some of these ornamental pears, if you catch them early enough, while they're still pretty dang tart, is they will have enough pectin in them to make a self-setting jelly, which I love because then you are not sacrificing on flavor in any way, shape, or form. You are not adding anything extra into the mix. Um, my little sister, I made her crab apple jelly from scratch for the first time while I was in New England three weeks ago, and now she won't stop talking to me about it. I have to mail her some in Atlanta now. Uh, so that is how good they are, and my sister is not a wild food enthusiast like I am. But like I said, another reason to be eating the calorie pears uh, is because they're wicked invasive. A lot of cities in the United States have started buyback programs where they're like, mm, we goofed, uh, but we can pay you a little bit of money if you cut these trees that we put into the ground down for us. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, Columbus is not one of those cities yet, but boy golly, would I love for it to be. That's going to be the first question I ask to our Urban Tree Canopy Collective the second that it hopefully passes our city council. Uh, a lot of other cities have urban tree canopy collectives. So that's a thing to look into if you are weirdly into the types of trees that your city chooses to plant like I am. Uh, I will say every time that I talk about these ornamental pears, calorie pears, Bradford pears, people will scream at me saying that the whole reason that they're planted is because they don't fruit, to which I'm going to tell you that is not always true. <laughs> Um, a lot of cities did better about planting sterile versions. Columbus did not. Within a three block radius of my house, there are, I am not kidding, 10 Bradford pears, each of which have fruit on them right now, which is going to make perry making season excellent for me. Um, but it also means my neighborhood smells real bad for about two weeks out of the year. <laughs> Hey, Alexis, we've got a question. How can you tell um, when crab apples and ornamental pears are ripe? So that is a tough one because a lot of times the way that you can tell that they are ripe is you suddenly have other competition for them. If you see a lot of bees hanging out uh, on or underneath the tree because it has started dropping ripe fruit, that is usually a really good indicator. Um, I will say one of my favorite things with crab apples, especially, is just taking mm, a little tiny taste of Rooney. Um, if it is way too tart for your liking, you can leave it alone or you can use it for jelly. Those ones are my favorite for jelly making, in my opinion. Uh, the great thing about crab apples and ornamental pears is as long as you are being mindful of the seeds inside, eating one that's a little underripe is not going to hurt you. Yeah, great question. So many great questions. Also, if anyone here is in Portland, Maine, um, I'm very jealous of how many crab apple trees you have. And I did fill all of my overall pockets <laughs> with crab apples while I was there visiting a few short weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Up next, oh yes, parting words, eat Bradford pears, please. <laughs> Eat Bradford pears, and if your city has a bounty on them, cut them down if they're on your property. Don't cut down your neighbor's trees without their permission. And then especially don't tell them that I told you to do it, please. <laughs> and next, I have gotten more questions about this tree this year than ever before, and I do not know why. Um, everyone has collectively chosen to recognize Cornus Causa, the Causa dogwood this year. I will say, so right now we're talking about fall forageables, which is why we are bringing him up. If we were talking about Cornus genus members, I would probably bring up the Cornelian cherry first as I like it a little bit better. That being said, Causa dogwoods can also be delicious and Aren't the fruits adorable? Like they look like something that you would see in a cute little cartoon, a fun little romantic magical girl anime. I love them. I have not had the best luck 
with harvesting them. Um, there are a couple trees in my neighborhood that I think just don't get, they don't get the TLC that they feel like they need each year. So they're a little, little grainy and the skins are very tough, which by and large I heal, I hear is just like a thing with your Kausa dogwood fruits. Um, yes. And as I'm seeing a lot of excitement about them in the chat, and it is because when I tell you that landscapers in the 90s and the 2000s were in love with the Kausa dogwood and with Cornelian cherries, which I get it, they flower very early in the spring and their flowers are big and beautiful and they really light up a yard or a park after a dark and dreary winter. And these guys have delicious fruits at the end. What's not to like? Um, they don't have my favorite texture by and large. I have found some that I think are absolutely divine in cities that do not belong to me. I found some delicious ones in Louisville, Kentucky. I found some delicious ones in Cincinnati where I grew up. And I found some delicious ones in Boston where my family is. And for some reason, all of the ones that I find in Columbus are not it. So maybe I'm just not looking hard enough. Maybe I need to ask some of my neighbors uh, if they have the hookup. These guys are also very hardy, which is why you are going to see them showing up in a lot of different growing zones. I have seen these guys growing as far north as like the southern part of Maine, all down through New England into the mid-Atlantic. I see them doing A-OK -okay here in the lower Midwest. I've seen them in the upper Midwest, and I'm pretty sure people also have them as ornamentals on the West Coast too. So mm, keep an eye out for them. This time of year especially, you will see them from a mile away. And we have some friends asking where in Cincy. I know it's near Eden Park. I have now not lived in Cincinnati for 11 years, so I'm horrible with street names. Um, if I... If I go down to Cincinnati to see my family and I find this house of dogwood, I will talk about it on the socials media. <laughs> I will say, even though they may not have the greatest texture, if you like the taste of them, a reminder, you can still do really fun things like uh, jellies and syrups or like juices and wines. You know, a fruit not having your favorite texture is, does, it's not the be all end all. It doesn't mean that you can't still enjoy it. You just gotta be a little creative. I'm really glad that like there's a Pittsburgh meetup going on in the chat. I love Pittsburgh. Um, being from Cincinnati, I know I'm not supposed to, but you guys have a very fine city. <laughs> and on to the next plant. This is one of my faves and much like the dandelion, it has a renaissance in Okay, that's it. I'm not allowed to use the word renaissance anymore. Everyone take a shot of your water. Um, if you catch me saying it again, your coffee, whatever beverage it is that you are enjoying in the time zone that you are in right now. Uh, anybody in the chat recognize this guy? I made sure to post a picture with the undersides of the leaves showing because I think that is very helpful in IDing this guy from a distance. Yeah, Haley. Haley, you have been coming through. Lauren, I see you coming through too. Oh, I see Maggie coming through with the genus name. You guys, yes, this is Mugwort Artemisia vulgaris. This is one of my favorite. It really does a whole lot for you in the kitchen. It can be a pot herb if you catch it while it is small and tender enough, but it also can be eaten as like a little like greens situation if you catch it young enough. I am obsessed with mugwort green tea. As folks who have been following me for more than a year probably know, mugwort green tea had like a gorilla grip on my social media last year because I love it so much. I had to make a point to not talk about it as much this year. <laughs> And it is in the same family as your wormwoods, um, both, uh, yeah, your wormwoods, beach wormwood, I also see showing up a lot in New England. I've been finding it a lot more on the beach the last couple of years than I remember seeing growing up, but maybe I wasn't looking for it. Oh, I'm loving all of these folks in here who are already repping the mugwort, loving the mugwort. So... The mugwort that started growing this past spring 
very tall, very easy to recognize from a distance now, but like way too bitter to be using as an herb or as a tea. Um, that being said, I got this tip from Michael Twitty. You can use the really long stems that they're on right now. Strip the leaves off, let them dry for a little bit. Use those guys as skewers when you're like barbecuing things or making things on the fire to impart a little bit of that saginess that the mugwort has to the food you're cooking on it. Genius, genius. I know so many cool, smart people. That being said, if you're also into making your own bitters, late season mugwort is absolutely your friend. You will not need a lot to taste it. <laughs> in your bitters this time of year. That being said, look for those tall ones that started growing in the spring because when you go, you come up to them and you look down on the ground, you, you know, part them a little bit, you will see baby mugworts that are coming up to play now that the temperature is starting to dip down into the, the cooler region in the evenings. I know we're coming in from a lot of different places here in Ohio. We just now started having it go into the 40s and the 50s overnight and this is like mugwort's time to shine it loves a cool evening and a mild or warm afternoon i uh mugwort roasted potatoes which is a recipe i originally got from marie viljoen's book forage harvest feast mugwort roasted potatoes rocked my entire world you just dice up your mugwort sprigs you toss them with some cubed potatoes and some olive oil some salt and pepper Pop those guys into the oven at like 375 for about 20 minutes. Give them a little flip -a rooney halfway through. Mwah. Beautiful. I love sage roasted potatoes too. And I think I like mugwort roasted potatoes better. Don't tell sage. Mm -hmm. The green tea process is a bit more laborious um, and a bit more, uh, you might accidentally burn the tips of your fingers. E, uh, but just to walk you through it real quickly, you're going to steam your mugwort to, uh, I, they call that the kill green, stops all the biological processes from going on in it. And then you're gonna press it real hard between your hands after it's done steaming. And then you're going to dry it in a pot that is warm enough to evaporate the water out of it, uh, but not so warm that you hurt yourself, please. And you're going to toast them up until they dry, set them aside for at least 24 hours. Mwah, beautiful green tea. So good. Um, some people say that the, the tea induces crazy dreams. I have had crazy dreams after having mugwort before, but I've also had crazy dreams not after having mugwort. So mm. there we go. Oh, someone's asking for the full name. So it is Marie Viljoen. I think I can actually write it in the chat. I forgot that I can do that. Uh, that is her name, and the book is called Forage, Harvest, Feast. I cannot type today. There we go. Boom shakalaka. If you are very into, like, making gourmet restaurant quality food with what you forage, her book is an excellent resource. And I do also love the little bit of history that she gives about each of the plants she covers. Mugwort is one of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hey Alexis, are there any mugwort lookalikes that people should be aware of? There are some mugwort lookalikes, especially this time of year, that is a wonderful call out. And one of them is ragweed. Ragweed looks a whole lot like mugwort. If you flip the leaves over though, ragweed will not have the silver underside that mugwort does. That being said, ragweed also edible, also edible. So it's not a tummy no-no lookalike. Um, I will also say the northern variation of Spanish needles, Biden's pinata, also has a very similar leaf shape to mugwort and to ragweed. I get that conflated with ragweed more so than I think people get it conflated with mugwort, which is also edible. So it's two biggest look, look alikes, uh, at least here in North America, are also plants that you can eat. That being said, a really great tell for mugwort, not only the silver undersides of the leaves, but breaking it and giving it a smell. It's very fragrant, very herby, very sagey, or as ragweed, if you break it and smell it. Um, first of all, if you have allergies, don't do that. Uh, that's just like signing your death warrant for the next 48 hours. But if you don't, or the ragweed isn't flowering and you give it a sniff, it's going to smell very 
green, you know, kind of in the way that like broken grass smells very green. Uh, there will not be any hints of saginess there. Same thing with Spanish needles, Biden's bipinata. So that being said, ragweed, I also think is delicious. But if you are a person uh, who gets punched in the nasal cavity <laughs> by ragweed each year, maybe don't. <laughs> Great questions all around. There we go. Everyone's been so good at recognizing all of these. This is not even like a foraging deep cut. Uh, so I know that a lot of you already know what this is. Nettles, heck yes. I see you, Kat. I see you, Shayna. I see you, Zachariah. I see you, Abdul. You guys are the best. <laughs> this is specifically stinging nettle, um, which I believe is Urtica dioecia, that being said, wood nettles also count in this too, uh, which is our native nettle species. Stinging nettle is imported from Europe. Wood nettle is our uh, North American nettle species. And right now, much like with mugwort, everything that started growing in the early spring is too tough to eat with the exception of the edible seeds. Uh, nettle seeds are delicious. Super tasty, very fun to like, oh my gosh, uh, the medicine circle on Instagram has rolled truffles in nettle seeds. And if you want something that's delicious and also want to be awake forever, then that is a really fun cooking project to do. So, oh no, is someone saying that it's not advancing? Oh no. I think if you're having trouble and you still see mugwort, try refreshing I see singing nettle on my end, so try okay. a quick refresh. Okay, we'll give a second for people to refresh. I'm making up a song as I go. What are we going to talk about next? I don't remember. We'll see when we get there. Yeah. Okay. I hope that gave everybody an opportunity to refresh and not hear my horrible song. Uh, I saw the number dip a ton, and now it has come back up, so I feel like we had a second. Okie dokie, refreshing work, noise. Perfect. <laughs> so your stinging nettles, much like with mugwort, uh, now is a very good time. Though I think maybe even in a couple of weeks where I am would be an even better time to start looking for baby stinging nettles, making a resurgence in the cooler temps. Super tasty. Be a bit mindful of the sting. I will say when it comes to stinging nettles, I can now stand holding them with my bare hands. Wood nettles, I cannot. I think you simply have to be built different to handle wood nettles without gloves. They hurt so bad. <laughs> of course, all of that sting is rendered inert once they are cooked or blended. Uh, so at least there's that. I know my friend Rachel, who is a wonderful forager up in the Northeast, up in Maine on the mid coast, was here and introduced me to adding nettle water to sparkling water. Um, what decadence, what health, what beauty, because also when you cook your nettles and you blend it all up, the nettle water is like this beautiful, magical, deep forest green. Um, that's like how I fooled myself into being super healthy earlier this year, was being like, I want to add the pretty green to my water or some in. <laughs> it's so beautiful. So thank you, Rachel. I love the foraging community because we are all just mixing and mingling and trading cool things that we've discovered. <laughs> So there you go, stinging nettles. Now is a great time to be looking for stinging nettle seeds on the older plants and to start keeping an eye out for the wee bitty babies. <laughs> hey, Alexis, we've got someone asking, what do you use the seeds for? Oh, I just think that they're a tasty treat by themselves, but you can also add them into like, say, a wild cracker dough. Um, you can either like dip them into the seeds right before you go into baking, or it can be mixed into the dough. Some people will top baked goods with them. Some people will put them on top of their like savory porridge in the morning. Uh, they're super tasty by themselves though. Uh, that being said, uh, I, and I hadn't noticed this until 
my friend Rachel, who's getting a lot of shout outs today, which she deserves, uh, pointed it out when I was visiting with her a few weeks ago. It kind of wakes you up a little bit <laughs> when you just eat uh, a handful of the seeds by themselves. Super tasty, super tasty. Yes, they are quite the stimulant. Uh, nothing insane. It's not going to feel like you just threw back, you know, a double Americano or anything, but it'll definitely wake you up a bit. There we go. Who knew that pawpaws were next? <laughs> I just saw Emily Gordon say pawpaws. I'm like, oh, how did you know? <laughs> uh, so here we have a couple different pictures, uh, both a pawpaw tree, just so you can see what it looks like, and a picture of a beautiful pawpaw that I had the uh, pleasure of trying at the pawpaw festival last year, last year, oh my gosh, last week, because I was a judge in the best pawpaw in Ohio contest, which honestly, I feel like that means I've peaked. I feel like that means I've peaked. So this is our pawpaw, Asamina Triloba. There we go. And it goes by a million other names, just the ones that I remember off the top of my head, Hillbilly Mango. Um, Appalachian banana. Um, there are a whole lot of indigenous names for it too. I know Umbi is the name for it in the Chata language. It has so many different names that it goes by. Like it's in the custody apple family, but Papa here in the United States uh, is what you will hear it called more often than not. I will say outside of the U.S., papaya is also often called a pawpaw. That makes for very uh, difficult Googling sometimes. So sometimes it's just better to type in the binomial nomenclature, Asamina triloba. They are absolutely delicious. And if you are lucky enough to live within their growing range, I highly recommend going out to your local creeks, streams, and rivers literally today. Like when this is done, don't go right now. When this is done, close your computer and make a beeline for like a small moving body of water and just follow your nose. So a lot of times people who live in the, the pawpaw belt, which kind of extends from the mid-Atlantic, moving west through the lower Midwest and through Appalachia, uh, goes a ways south. Uh, once you get into Georgia and Florida, though, you will also start seeing Asamina parviflora, which is the small flowered pawpaw, still delicious, more shrubby in stature as opposed to a tree like a pawpaw. Um, Florida also has like a million different Asamina members, but a lot of them are endangered, which is sad. And they are much more diminutive than Asamina triloba and Asamina parviflora. And people who live in the pawpaw belt will often say, you say that they're everywhere. Why don't I see them? And my answer is always because you cannot, you, you haven't trained your eye to recognize them from a distance yet. And I swear to goodness, I swear to gosh, once you know what a pawpaw looks like from a distance, you will be able to pick them out from so far away. And the, the tip is they have these big, glossy, dark green leaves that all like to hang downwards when the tree is doing well. Like you see in this here picture, they also are not that tall. Uh, they do not get especially huge. I've seen a handful of exceptions to that rule. There are some pawpaws near me that are maybe uh, a solid 50 feet tall, and I've never seen a pawpaw taller than that. I usually see them top out closer to 20 feet, and they have a very skinny, very bendy, smooth gray trunk. So it'll just be <laughs> like, like they're wearing a little stiletto heel, very tiny right here at the bottom, and then it fills out with this nice canopy of downward facing leaves uh, at the top. And I think I wrote out all of that. Yep, there it is. All the words that I just said, but more succinct <laughs> on the slide that I wrote ahead of time. And looking for them on slopes near small moving bodies of water uh, almost always works for me. They like keeping their toes wet. They don't like being in water uh, for extended periods of time is what I have found works 
best for them. For anyone who's wanting to plant pawpaws in their area, uh, they're still very hardy in a lot of areas of the United States, even if they're not native there. I see people having luck growing them in Portland, Oregon. I see people having luck growing them in Northern California. The Coastal Botanic Gardens in Maine have a couple pawpaw samples that are all doing fantastically. So even if you are outside of their native range, that doesn't mean you can't grow a pawpaw on your property. You know, uh, you're gonna want two that are different genetically if you want them to be fruiting, but they're also not huge trees. So that's not a huge thing to do. Pawpaws taste like a magical mixture of banana, mango. Some of them air a little pineapple-y. Some of them air a little caramel, burnt marshmallow toasty. Last week I got to try so many and I didn't realize the breadth of flavors of pawpaws. I even had a pawpaw that tasted almost exactly like an avocado. I need to find another one that tastes like that because I swear that <laughs> pawpaw guacamole would be absolutely fantastic and I need to try it. Uh, I've gotten it in my head that I want it and now I need to try it before the season is <laughs> over. So if anyone has the hookup on very savory skewing pawpaws, let a girl know. I should just ask the person who submitted that pawpaw to the best pawpaw competition. Mm hmm. Let's see. Okie dokie. And now. Hey, Alexis, ooh. can I ask you a couple quick papa questions? Oh, please do. I love I love papa questions. So we've got a question. How do you know when papas are ripe and can they ripen at home? Oh, this is a spicy question during this time of the year. The best way to know that a papa is ripe is you found it on the ground, much like with our native persimmons. They get soft as they ripen, and once they get to a point of optimal softness, they will simply fall off of the tree because they are often quite heavy. That being said, the shaking method, uh, I find that to be much more effective with pawpaws and getting ripe ones than it is with persimmons. If you give a pawpaw tree just a gentle ch -ch and see what falls down, those guys are going to be delightful for eating as well. Uh, just mind your head. If you say, oh, am I going to sneeze? Is it going to happen? No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> intrigue here in our, our lecture today. If you say, we're very excited, and you found a pawpaw tree, and you plucked some of the firm ones off of the tree, here, here's, I'm going to tell it to you straight. If they are soft enough, that you can push a thumb into them and it leaves a bit of an indentation. I would throw those guys into a paper bag with a banana, or if you're allergic to bananas like me, any other like ethylene producing fruit to speed up the ripening process. But if you brought those guys home and they're still pretty rock hard, uh, they're going to rot on your counter before they are worth eating. And for that, I am very sorry. And life is all about learning. Life is all about learning. Yeah, so that would be my that would be my answer for that question. We had a few that were on a dying branch that my partner brought home in our kitchen that were like right on the cusp. And I'm very curious to see if they end up ripening. Very curious. <laughs> they haven't yet. Oh, Haley's asking how the pawpaw song goes, the way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. Um, that is a song that you will hear here on the lower Midwest and in Appalachia and literally nowhere else. I feel like if I sing it elsewhere, everyone looks at me like I'm crazy. That being said, it's like gently a creepy song. I don't know. I'll let you guys listen to it on your own time and report back on how you feel about the lyrics of the song Way Down Yonder in the Pop Pop Patch. There we go. And... Let's go to our next plant. It is already 1230. I told myself I was going to be so speedy this year. <laughs> so speedy this fall. And that has not been the case. I like talking to you guys so much. Oh, the best pawpaw tip I can give you is follow your nose. You will smell them before you see them, especially this time of year. Uh, you, you will smell the ripe ones, but even more you will smell the ones that are slightly starting to ferment on the ground because they will smell kind of like a honeyed vinegar situation. 
Up next, uh, for anyone who follows my TikTok, you have already heard me yell about these. For everyone who follows my Instagram, I'm so sorry I'm so bad about transferring my posts over, but you'll hear about these later today. And yes, Lauren. Oh, coming out here with the genus name because you know that you see two different types. Yes, these are the members of the Coriolis genus, the hazels. Uh, I will see people calling them hazel nut trees. Uh, I know technically they are hazel trees. I am one of those people who will often just call them hazel nut trees. I know that the hazel nuts are the nut of the hazel. I digress. Coriolis americana is our native hazel species. Uh, and those are these guys in the cute little papery sheets up above. But you will see a lot of different types of hazels planted as ornamentals in cityscapes. Here in Columbus, uh, I feel like it's kind of uh, not a secret anymore, but there's like a huge stand of Turkish hazelnuts on Columbus State's campus. <laughs> and I understand why. They're beautiful trees, and a lot of the Turkish hazelnuts will actually reach tree stature, whereas an American hazel stays much more compact, much more shrubby and round and close to the ground. I also am shrubby and round and close to the ground nine times out of 10, so I can't fault them for that. <laughs> uh, so this is, oh, I see, <laughs> sorry, I just noticed that my partner is in the chat. Hi, Jeff. Oh, I see people talking about chestnuts. I'm jealous of everyone who's participating in the chat. <laughs> so this is the hazel. Uh, I also, yes, I have to call them filberts. Yesterday, I only referred to them as hazelnuts. And everyone on the West Coast let me know that they, they loved me, but I needed to also call them filberts. So this is, there is no filbert erasure going on in this talk today. That is another name that especially the American hazelnut goes by. They will often come in these papery sheets. Uh, if it's American, Turkish hazelnuts come in like terrifying nightmare husks, but they're worth it because the nut meat on the inside is absolutely delicious. I honestly follow the squirrels, follow the squirrels. They will almost always this time of year lead you to some sort of nut or fruit that you can also be sharing with them, but make sure you share. Don't take everything. Don't have them lead you to something nice and then take all of your shared bounty. That's very unfair. And I get this question a lot. Witch hazel is not, is not a Coriolis. They are not related to each other. Um, historically, human beings are very bad at naming plants. <laughs> Witch hazels are fun too. And we're probably getting to the time of year where their little seed pods are about to start exploding at people. So that's just something to be wary of. <laughs> and up next, I do not see this particular tree or the nuts that it produces getting a whole lot of airtime here in the United States, as opposed to uh, in Western Europe, where you do still pe see people talking about it a lot, and it is still very much a part of the food culture. And that, for anybody who does not recognize this smooth bark without people's names carved into it, yes, Lily, it is the beach. Good job. So this is the, we are looking at the American beach right now, uh, which by and large, a much bigger tree with much bigger leaves than its European counterparts. Uh, and there are a couple things that you should know about this tree. One, which is an easy way to ID them that I also hate. It is a favorite tree of hooligans because its bark is so smooth and paper-like that it is a favorite for people to carve their names into. Uh, that is literally how I taught one of my best friends to recognize beech trees, is she just looked for people carving their names into trees in wild spaces long enough until she also started recognizing the other key features, like the leaves and the nuts. Uh, we have to stop people from doing this. And I'm always surprised that it is still happening. I will see fresh name carvings, heart carvings, you name it, into these sweet baby beans that did nothing wrong to anybody. Next, a thing 
that I do need to point out, and it is that the nut meat of these is called gently toxic while raw. Now, what does that mean, you might be wondering? Well, for starters, you can probably get away with eating a handful of them and having nothing happen. That being said, there are some some saponins, some glycosides in small quantity in them that are destroyed by the roasting process. And by and large, if you are eating like beach butter or beach oil, that, I mean, not by and large, it is coming from a beech nut that was roasted before it was processed. Heat breaks down those compounds. So unless, so if you only want to eat like three, go for it. Eat a few in the field. I've done it. I'm still here standing today. I have friends whose kids do it too. That being said, if you are really wanting to enjoy them in quantity, if you are wanting to make a nut butter out of them, because they do have a very high oil content, which I think is worth noting if you, you know, were feeling very intrepid and wanted to make your own oil this year, beaches are what I would recommend just because it's easy to make a nut butter out of them and have the oil all float to the top, as opposed to say like acorns, or a lot of our other nuts, will you, where you will need a device to press the oil out of them. Beaches, that is not the case. But please roast them, please. Uh, I will also say beech trees love to fake you out. You will start recognizing this as you work with them more, uh, but they love to fire blanks in these here husks. <laughs> You will start seeing though, as you pick a husk up, one, you will feel when it is heavy enough to have nuts inside. And two, when you open the husk up, they will sink in a bit. The little nut on the inside, the shell that they come in, if there is no nut on the interior. Because nothing is worse than opening up the husk, peeling off the shell, and then seeing it's empty. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. But they gotta fake out squirrels. So some of their seeds have a chance at becoming new trees. I think it's very cool and very sneaky and kind of the beech trees version of having mast years and light years like acorns do. Do we have any beech? We do. Some folks are asking if they should pick the nuts from the ground or the tree. So... Picking them from the ground is always difficult just because they are tiny. It is easy for them to get lost. If you are going to be picking them from the trees, I would just wait until these husks are already starting to look a little dry, brown, and open. Once they have like definitively separated and don't just have the tiny little crack of separation at the top, you're good to start harvesting them directly from the tree. It's also a really good way to beat the squirrels to them. But once again, do not use your opposable thumbs for evil. Leave some of them for the squirrels and for the beach to continue its progeny as well. And Alexis, how would one go about making an oil out of beech nuts? So what you're going to want to do is roast those beech nuts. You're going to, you know, peel the shell off of them. So we see the like three stages of beech nut processing up here in this photo. This is them while they are still inside of their husk. This is them when they are just inside of their tiny flexible shell that the nuts come in. And then this is a peeled nut. So you're gonna go ahead and get them all to this stage, roast them in the oven for about 15 minutes if they're fresh. Uh, if they're dry, you can probably cut that down to seven to 10. And then you're gonna put them through a food processor until it forms a smooth nut butter and then let it sit. And like all fresh nut butters that don't have like any stabilizers or anything in them, the oil will eventually float to the top. Yay. Thanks, Alexis. You're welcome. You're welcome. These are all great questions. Okay, yes, my parting words, gotta roast. <laughs> if there's anything that you take from this slide, roast, please. Mm -hmm. And yes, we mentioned them on the last slide. I very purposely tried to put these in like thought order for the way that my brain works. And now we are going to talk about another nut that is even more prolific and even more globally spread. And that is the acorn, which is the, you know, the nut produced by members of the Quercus genus, our oaks. 
The beautiful thing about acorns is they are truly global. Um, every, I believe every livable continent has a native oak. You won't find them in Antarctica, but if you find yourself in Antarctica, I don't think that acorn processing is what you would be spending time on right now anyway. So I'm just gonna quickly on this slide, talk about two of my favorites. Uh, and then I'm going to walk you guys through the process of how to cold leach your acorns because it's acorn season. It's here, it's happening. If you're in the Northern Midwest, it has been acorn season. If you are here in the lower Midwest with me or in the mid Atlantic, acorn season has truly just begun. This has been the first week that I have found a bunch that were not yeeted from the tree because of defects. So the two acorns I'm gonna talk about, and I actually have examples of both of them right here. We love an example, is the white oak acorn. Thank you, Grace, so speedy. The white oak acorn and the bur oak acorn. Now the map that you saw on the slides is for the bur oak. And I felt like it was important to highlight this one because I think it's hilarious that in the state of Maryland, you have like a nice little sliver going through in Appalachia and then there's a teeny tiny little bit of green and part of that is where Washington DC is. So if you are uh, calling in from around the US Botanic Garden, uh, you will be able to find bur oaks. So yay for you guys. And the rest of that green area is here in the Midwest, both North Midwest, all the way down through like the South South in Texas where you can find them. And the reason why they are important is because they will give you the most bang for your buck. They are the biggest acorns on average in North America. And the thing with acorns is you want to minimize the amount of work that you have to do because you have to do a lot of work. I wanna walk you through very quickly, just let me bring my terrifying uh, device onto camera. This is a huge mechanical nutcracker. It has the worst name known to mankind. It is called, I'm so sorry for this, Grandpa's Goody Getter. So RIP for the year of my life that I lost and having to say that phrase. But the reason why I have it is twofold. One, it's like one of the only nutcrackers you can get that cracks through black walnuts. And this year I really wanted to process black walnuts. They break other nutcrackers. And two, it's perfect for cracking through big acorns as well. So I'm gonna pop this guy in. I don't think, you know what, I'm gonna bend this down so we can watch this happen in real time. And we're just gonna go ahead and, we love sound effects. There we go. Ha ha, back up. And let me free this guy from his grandpa's goody getter prison. And now we have a nice crack that has been started in here. Now, burr oak acorns are white oaks. And I hear a whole lot of stories about the different types of oaks and which ones you should be preferential towards in terms of how long it takes to make them not bitter. And what I hear mostly is that you should be going for white oaks instead of red oaks. And while by and large, on average, white oaks will have fewer tannins than your red oaks, some of the most tannic acorns. <laughs> Mustard's very passionate about this. That's my dog, Colonel Mustard. I know. That's why someone's at our door. Well, can't do anything about that. Welcome to real time, real life in my household. <laughs> As I rapidly try to unpeel this acorn, there we go. So some of our most tannic acorns are white oaks. That being said, two of the white oaks that are native to my area, which is the white oak, Quercus alba, and the burr oak, which is also in the white oak family, uh, are not super tannic. So here we go. That is a peeled nut meat <laughs> of a burr oak acorn and we'll split it in half. There we go. Ooh, if I put my hand behind it like a makeup influencer. Ooh, wow. 
So what you do is you crack open your acorns, you peel off the papery skin, and then you go and you drop them. I like to drop them directly into water as I work because it keeps them from oxidizing. A lot of acorns will oxidize pretty quickly. But I should have started with this. A really good way to save time is to look out for a couple key issues, namely this hole. <laughs> if you see a small, perfectly circular hole and an acorn that you were picking up, congratulations, uh, an acorn weevil, an acorn weevil beat you to that nut meat uh, and it is not worth picking up. The sneaky thing is though, sometimes the acorn weevils are in your acorns but have not like emerged yet. A lot of times looking at the top of your acorn, please focus, looking at the top of your acorn and looking for like dark discoloration like you see up here, is indicative that uh, a tiny baby acorn weevil is in there who will free itself in a bowl on your countertop in the night, like what happened with this one. <laughs> acorn weevils are also edible. I have friends who forage who will uh, fry them up and eat them or will feed them to their chickens or will feed them to their pets. A couple of things to keep in mind, if you are not good with things that look like grubs, uh, acorn weevils are going to be very much not your jam. <laughs> so take extra precaution about uh, making sure you get ones that don't have them in there. I am loving Michelle's energy, fight back, eat the weevils. <laughs> and if you're into eating bugs, which I am told is a lot of the future of the food industry, go for it. Go for it. Uh, my friend Eric of the Woods, usually this time each year, goes through a little how-to video in his Instagram stories about how to process acorn weevils. Uh, I just see them and, uh, and cry a little bit and then gently place them outside. Be very careful when you're handling them. Keep them in like the bowl or the jar that you captured them in because they will bite you. They will bite you if given the opportunity and their teeth are sharp enough to make those perfect little circular holes uh, in an acorn shell. So that's just something to keep in mind. <laughs> this is what I mean by I could give a lecture solely on acorns. Uh, do we see how long <laughs> that just took? Uh, but yes, we're going to talk about how once you've shelled your acorns, once you've put them into water, the process that you can use in order to make an acorn flower, bada bing, bada boom, the things that you are going to need, uh, your float tested and shelled acorns. Float testing is another really great way to know if an acorn weevil has beat you to it, you goober, because cavities will form in the acorn where the weevil has done its dirty work, where it has gone to town, where it has had a snack, and it will make those acorns float. If you put your acorns into water, what you want to do is discard all of the ones that are floating and keep the rest. Not necessarily as foolproof as just looking for the signs of entry for an acorn weevil, but like a very good way to eliminate some that maybe have also started rotting that you can't necessarily tell from the outside. You're also going to need cold water for this particular method, time. And when I say time, I mean like a hefty chunk of time, not like an hour, uh, like a couple of days if you wanna do the more hands-off method and a couple hours if you wanna do hands-on. Uh, I change my mind during the course of acorn season, which one I prefer. Right now I'm very much pre preferring the like being up on my feet for a few hours. That will likely change over the next month. So you shelled your acorns, you threw them into water to halt the oxidation. And once you're done with all of your shelling, uh, maybe, maybe treat yourself to a, to a manicure, to a, a hand massage. Uh, your hands are probably going to be a little bit mad at you <laughs> because you got to do a lot of work in order to get to this point. Uh, treat yourself. Do people still say that? That's probably a chuggy thing to say now. Now, if you are a strange human like me, what you're going to do next is throw your acorns, your shelled acorns, and some fresh water into a food processor or a blender, and you are going to blend them until your acorns are like wee bitty grits, like wee bitty very tiny grits. And then you're going to strain those acorn grits into a cheesecloth. 
I will say, if you are someone who also likes making acorn jelly, Dottori Muk, the Korean acorn jelly, you also will want to keep the milky water that comes out of the blender with your acorns. Uh, and you're going to want to let that sit in your fridge until all of that very fine starch sinks to the bottom. And you can leach it separately using this same method. Uh, not the squeezing method, the hands-off method. Do not try to squeeze strain your acorn starch or you'll lose it all. So what I do when I am in a rush to get acorns uh, leached of their tannins, because that's what you have to do to acorns in order to be able to enjoy eating them and for eating them to be a safe experience, I will put my acorn grounds into a cheesecloth and I will just let cold water run over them for the sink as I periodically like squeeze out the water, let water refill it, squeeze out the water, let the water refill it uh, and taste every few minutes until the grounds do not taste bitter anymore. Uh, it's very, I would say like aim for acorns that are less tannic for this, unless you want to be standing for two hours doing this. Uh, but if you also want to be standing for two hours doing this, bet. If you also have fresh water running through your property, you can put those grounds into that cheesecloth, a little gunny sack that's porous enough, uh, tie them to a little anchor on land and just toss them into your creek or stream for a couple of hours and just let the moving water do the work for you. Pick them up in a couple hours, right as rain. Some people also will put them in the top tank of their toilet which I know is sanitary, but there's something about it that I just can't get on board with. But if you can get on board with, you can go ahead and leach them that way too, uh, because fresh water is also constantly running through the top tank of your toilets. Now, if you don't want to be like actively leaching them for a few hours, you can always just put your grounds and fresh water into say a mason jar and twice a day, usually first thing in the morning and maybe sometime around lunch, pour off the water very carefully so you don't lose your grounds and refill it with fresh water. And over the course of a couple days, whew, or in the case of some red oaks that I processed last week, over the course of two, last week, last year, Words are hard. It took me two weeks to leach my red oak acorns last year, which is why I love that tree. Um, but I am trying to find others <laughs> that take a little less time. Uh, that's a way to do it too. That's a bit more hands off. You only have to think about it twice a day, but you have to think about it for more than one day. So this is how you make acorn flour. Once you are done leaching it, it's not bitter anymore. You can grind it even smaller, even more fine if you want to for baking. You can make acorn grits with them while the grits are still pretty big. And this is great because cold leaching leaves the starches in the acorns intact, which means you can do things like make bread and have it still bind to itself pretty well. Whereas if you hot leach your acorns, which is another method of removing the tannins, you are going to destroy the starches in the heat, which is fine if you're only using them to say, make like a knockoff Nutella or to make a savory acorn spread. Or if you just wanna roast the acorns and eat them like a snack, like you would a roasted cashew, in that case, hot leach them. That's just putting them in different changes of boiling water uh, until they're not bitter anymore. There is a wives' tale that you have to transfer them out of boiling water and into new boiling water, or you'll like bind the tannins to them. And that is not true, but it is faster to just move them from one pot of boiling water to another. That being said, you can still like strain the water out if you only have the one uh, pot to be using, refill it with new fresh water, and then bring it up to boiling again. That will still work. It'll just take a little less time. Yay, that was so much acorn talk. Uh, I am so very sorry, everyone. <laughs> well, we've got some acorn questions if you're willing to take some, Alexis. Oh, I would love to take some acorn questions. So if one does not have a grandpa's goody gutter, how would one shell acorns? I have used uh, the little handheld nutcrackers, like the ones that you can use both for nuts or for lobster shells. <laughs> Uh, I've used those to crack acorns open before. Uh, I also have used the nutcracker to like hold the base of the acorn so it'll hold steady. And then I just boop, bop it with a hammer or a wide rock to get a nice crack open to peel it the rest of the way. 
Uh, I also have a big hand crank nutcracker that works really well for cracking a lot of acorns in uh, rapid succession too. And if you're just planning on grinding them down into flour anyway, you can always use the method where you put a bunch of them under, you know, a towel and just go to town with your hammer and then go through and remove the shells and put the nut meat into water from there. Thank you. And then you're we've welcome. got some basic questions that are, let's see, do only oaks have acorns and are all acorns edible? Um, only oaks have acorns and all acorns are edible. Uh, they just have ranging amounts of tannins that you have to take into account when it comes to processing, but all acorns are edible. So regardless of where you are in the world, if acorns are falling right now, uh, you can get to snacking. Awesome. And then when you're making acorn flour, you're leaching the tannins. How do you know when you're done leaching? This is uh, everyone's least favorite answer to this question, but it is the best answer that I have found. And it's you have to taste it. <laughs> uh, you have to taste it. In fact, I would even recommend trying an itty bitty little bit at the beginning of the leaching process, just so you know what you're moving away from. That little tiny bit uh, will not hurt you. There are tannins present in so many things that we eat. You just can't have them in super high quantities. Awesome. Thanks, Alexis. And then do you have time for a couple questions from our audience? Oh, heck yes, of course. I'm so excited. Um, we've got a lot of folks asking for some general recommendations about resources that you might use to uh, get into foraging. Boom. There we go. Boom. There we go. Boom. There we go. So here are some of my favorite books, two of which have come out in the last year, uh, and the other three are all of Sam Thayer's books. So we can start with those. Uh, for those of you who are not like deeply steeped in the foraging community, uh, there is an amazing wild food author named Sam Thayer, and he has written a number of excellent IDing books that not only give you the tools that you need to be able to ID out in the field, but also gives you a whole lot of background about how and where and when these foods were eaten in the past, and kind of gives you a really great jumping off point for then doing your own food research after. So his three books are The Forager's Harvest, which is the one that I see mentioned the most. It's kind of like the tome for North American foraging. Then there is also Nature's Garden, and Incredible Wild Edibles. And so those are all Samuel Thayer's books. I have all of them. I would recommend getting all of them if you're really into foraging. Uh, they, they're just fantastic in the way that Sam approaches food writing and like wild food writing especially and IDing and botany. It's really approachable. Uh, and there are also a lot of little fun stories and jokes hidden amongst them too. And these other two books just came out in the past year. So if you are more interested in the food aspect and in being very creative with the wild foods that you bring home, Alan Burgo's book, Flora, just came out this year. He is doing like a four part wild food series. Flora is the first book. Uh, I believe he also has one coming out for fauna, one coming out for fungi, uh, just kind of covering his bases and keeping his books organized that way. And it is fantastic for opening your eyes to a lot of different plants that we kind of know are edible, but don't typically get a lot of play in the wild food space. Uh, for example, he goes through making like dolma with a ton of different wild leaf wrappers. You can do you can do, you know, little rice wrappies with more than just grape leaves. You can use like sunchoke leaves or you can use sochan leaves. Uh, you can use sylphium perfilatolia leaves. There's like a whole lot of options you can choose. And so if you're really into the foodie side of all things foraging, I feel like his book is pretty indispensable. Uh, also, Liz Knight's Forage. Uh, so Liz Knight is a forager from the UK. So I will say this book does lean a bit in the direction of plants that are also readily available in the UK. 
I would say maybe five of the plants are not plants that you find or find regularly here in North America, but they have stand-ins that you can. Uh, I know that she mentions slows, uh, a type of plum that you find in the UK. And while we don't have slows, we have, you know, Prunus Americana and Prunus Maritima. So it's very easy to make trades for her recipes. And her recipes are wonderful, very approachable, very easy to follow, and also delicious. She did so much research as to where so many of these foods fit in globally to a lot of different food cultures. And I just think it's a beautiful book and I haven't seen enough people talking about it this year. So those are, that is my very long answer to the question about foraging resources. That was great. Thanks, Alexis. And no problem. We've got a couple more questions. So are there any vulnerable species in the North, Northeast that foragers should avoid? Oh, gosh. So it really depends on where in the Northeast uh, and the Mid-Atlantic that you are. I know we had this talk in spring. Always happy to have this talk again. And it's when it comes to ramps, like that's a thing to definitely be mindful of. There's some places like here in the Midwest where ramps are still extraordinarily plentiful and we don't really want to change that. And then there are areas in the Northeast where ramps used to be plentiful and now uh, both because of industrialization and because of harvesting, numbers are dwindling. Uh, I know, what is it? Allium trichocum, variation trichocum. So there are two like variations of ramps you'll see here in the Eastern United States, but that particular variation was listed as endangered in the state of New York. And I believe it is now on the watch list in the state of Tennessee. So that is something to keep in mind. Uh, I would say beach plums in the Northeast, we're seeing a lot fewer of them than we used to, uh, even fewer than I remember seeing growing up now, and I'm like almost 30 years old. So that is one where, you know, harvesting the fruit doesn't necessarily hurt the plant, but a cool thing to do to kind of give back would maybe be to plant some of those pits after you have harvested. Awesome. And then for our last question, people are asking about kind of the safety of foraging and and how do you um, how do you balance foraging on sort of public and private lands? And yeah, can you speak to that? Absolutely. So there, I guess, are two main camps when it comes to talking about foraging and safety. There's like the very obvious one, which is like, how do I know that the things that I am eating are not contaminated with something? And then there's a the safety aspect of how do I know that I'm supposed to be doing this here and won't get in trouble? We can talk about both of those. When it comes to foraging, especially in urban environments, I will see a lot of people being very wary of whether or not like car exhaust or uh, salt from the roads are affecting what it is that you are gathering. I am very mindful not to gather within, I'd say, 60 feet of railroads and of major highways. That being said, a thing that I have to remind people, and it's not a fun thing to hear, but it's a true thing to hear, is that farms don't exist in vacuums. Farms are also very privy to heavy metals coming from the roads that often run along them and from the pollution that is often coming from the cities that are near them or even coming from, you know, devices that are on said farms. So it's very hard to avoid it's very hard to avoid pollution, period. And that's not just for the stuff you're pulling up with your own hands. That's even for like the spinach that you're getting at the grocery store. One of my friends, Candace, who is um, The Curb on Instagram, did a really fun test testing the lead levels in some lamb's quarters versus the lead levels in spinach that she got at the grocery store. And the spinach actually had higher lead levels. And she lives in New York City. Granted, it's going to fluctuate, of course, depending on where you're gathering and depending on, you know, when and where the spinach you're buying is harvested. But oop, <laughs> that is the sneeze I've been keeping in this entire lecture. Um, but it all depends. You're always taking things with a grain of salt. The EPA does have um, a very, like, uh, it's updated very frequently, but a map of spills that are reported to the EPA. And it also lets you know whether or not those spills are like dangerous or whether or not they're innocuous. So 
especially if you're doing things like foraging around bodies of water, I do like to check that map and see if any spills have happened upstream of where it is that I am foraging. If you're doing sea foraging, uh, checking, especially if you have like a robust fishing community, water quality levels are going to have to be posted for those folks in order to keep doing their business. So if you're say harvesting seaweed, you should check in and see what the water quality is looking like. If there's some sort of algal bloom that's keeping people from harvesting shellfish or keeping people from harvesting lobsters or fish, you shouldn't be harvesting seaweed either. Oh yes, and Ruth pointed out a great one, check for super fun sites too. Uh, so those are all things to keep in mind when it comes to foraging safety. I also hear a lot of people being sad uh, and worried about like animals possibly using the bathroom on or around what they are harvesting, to which I will say uh, urea is a major component in a lot of commercial fertilizers. And also you don't know what's using the bathroom on your kale before it makes it to the shelves at Kroger. So wash everything that you bring home to eat, even if it's from the grocery store, is the TLDR of the safety talk. And when it comes to knowing whether or not you are following the rules, a lot of places will be purposefully vague about their foraging rules. And it is one of my least favorite things. We're all, a lot of us are a generation of gently anxious human beings, but never be afraid to call a park ranger and ask. Uh, the worst thing that they will tell you is no. Uh, sometimes they will even have conversations with you in which it will end up that the conversation's a bit more complex. They might let you do things like harvest garlic mustard and harvest autumn olives, uh, but maybe won't let you harvest things that are like cutting into native species and prohibiting them from like reaching their full fruiting potential. Uh, I've had great conversations with a lot of different park rangers where even if the rules posted or like we don't recommend foraging here at this park, we'll say, oh no, but we absolutely like do, you just need to talk to us about it first. There are also in a lot of the national forests permits that you have to apply for for certain plants. Here in Ohio, if you love Wayne National Forest as much as I do, um, foraging for nuts and berries is allowed, uh, foraging for fruits is allowed, Mushrooms, it varies from place to place, but if you wanna forage um, wild ginger, cohosh, or um, golden seal, you have to apply for a permit for those, just because those are species that we're very much trying to not accidentally have go extinct. So that would be my recommendation. I know talking to people that we don't know is never fun. I don't like doing it either, but sometimes that's the easiest way if a like specific no, unless a specific don't forage here rule is posted, that's the easiest way I have found to find out. Well, thank you so much for this amazing presentation, Alexis. This was really fantastic. And uh, thanks to everyone who joined us today.